Our topic this evening is the unfaithful steward in the last days. The unfaithful stewards in the last days. Luke 16 is where we're going, beginning with verse 1. Say amen when you have that. Amen. We're in Luke 16 and verse 1, the Bible says this. It says, and he said unto, said, Lord, and he said also unto his disciples. Let's stop there. He said, it said, also unto his, what? Disciple. Why does it say he said also unto his disciples? Here, of course, he's going to give a parable in the 16th chapter of Luke to his disciples. But the Bible said he said also unto his disciples. In other words, there were other people in the audience or in the congregation where Jesus was giving these talks that were also needed to be understood when we look at this parable or this understanding. If you go back, hold your finger down, Luke 16, to the 15th chapter of Luke, we'll see that we see the story really pick up or start in the 15th chapter of Luke. Luke 15, beginning with verse 1, says this. We're holding our finger in the 16th chapter, but going back to Luke 15. Luke 15, 1 says, Then drew near unto him all the what? Publicans. All the publicans and sinners for to So who was there? Publicans. publicans and sinners. Look at verse 2. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Who was there? So you had the Pharisees and scribes on one side, then you had the what? Public. Publicans and sinners, and right close to Christ, as we told the Zion at all times, to hear the clearest words of Christ were who? The disciples. There were how many groups? Three groups. Three groups. And this first parable, we find in the 15th chapter of Luke, is for the Pharisees, where it says, And he spake this parable unto them, saying, and deals with having a hundred sheep and losing. It says in the 16th chapter now, as we go through all this parabolic teaching, or Christ giving teaching in parables, the 16th chapter comes now, and said, And he said also unto his disciples this parable. How many groups were there? Three groups. Three groups. You had the who? Publicans and sinners, number one. Number two, the scribes and Pharisees. And number three, you had the disciples. And Christ was speaking to these individuals. Now, all these parables, if you read carefully the book of Zion and also the book of Christ, I'll be listening, we know that these parables were not only for scribes and Pharisees. Were they not? Not only for them. They were not only for publicans and sinners, even though he came to not call the righteous, but sinners unto repentance. We know that. But these lessons were largely for who? The disciples. the disciples. Who would be the continuing preaching expositors of the scriptures. Upon them, the gospel would be forwarded. And to them, these lessons were for. So in other words, these individuals were listening in to the school of the prophets. He was instructing those people that would continue the work, but these lessons were largely for them upon whom the labor of the work would rest, even though they had strong, solemn rebukes and, and warnings to others to the coming and even ever-present kingdom of God. In Luke 16, we say this parable given concerning the unjust steward. And the Bible says this parable is given for the disciples. It is given to instruct the disciples on something spiritual, something eternal, something dealing with the gospel that we must also understand because we're also disciples. Amen? Amen. But also we cannot ignore the fact that in this congregation or in this school of the prophet session, whether by live stream or in the earshot, there were sinners Publicans, scribes, and but right now there's some scribes and Pharisees tuned in by live stream. <laughs> trying to see what we're doing over here. Amen, myself. Trying to see what we're doing. Figure out what we're, our next move is. Find out how can they hinder the work. But it's too late. It's too late. The work's already started going. There's no way you can turn this work back. And if you try to, you happily be fine working against the power and movement of God. But by the way, just as we are today, so it was then when the gospel is preached. The word has different audiences there, and the message is going to all, but it's to instruct those upon whom the gospel will be actually forwarded by. Got to think about that. So when we look at this parable in the 16th chapter of Luke, and we're laying a foundation here, in the 16th chapter of Luke, even though this parable is for the disciples, remember, Christ is also giving warnings to the scribes, the elders, the Pharisees, as well as to publicans and sinners. And the story in the 16th chapter of Luke is dealing with something that literally happened to the publicans and sinners. Which called the Pharisees say, see how evil these people are? But Christ took this news story, this media event, and the hype and whispering about it to cause his truth to be even more talked about. Because when Jesus connected truth with current events, oh, how many people were tuning in 
to see what truth was. I hope you're thinking about that. I hope you're thinking about it. this. Is a, this is Christ's method. Verse 1, Luke 16, verse 1. There was a certain rich man which had a steward. A steward is someone who was given charge over the affairs and finances and goods, services, effects of another. Rich man had a certain steward. And the same was accused, the same steward was accused unto him that he had wasted this rich man's goods. He had taken this, these goods and wasted them. He had taken them from their purpose and used it for another purpose and destroyed these goods. Verse 2, and he called him, the rich man called him and said unto him, how is it that I hear this of thee? You know, it's interesting, I find that in this parable, even though it's a parable, he didn't say, I heard this about you. He said, how is it I heard this about you? Yeah. In other words, you are so able to deceive and lie and use this money wrong, but you're not able to cover your tracks? How is it I'm hearing this of you? Mm. You've been doing this for a long time. How is it this got out? How did you get caught? You were doing a good job. I have to commend you. You were doing a good job. How did I hear this about you? He says, Give an account of thy stewardship. For thou mayest be no longer what? In other words, no matter how good your story is, no matter how many people you can blame, no matter how plausible the way that you can put this, this scenario, that it makes it seem like there was a reason for you to do this, you already have lost stewardship. I've come to you to let you know that I know. I've heard this of you. I want to know, number one, how did, I, can, how did you let this get out? Number one. Number two, I want you to explain the way that you robbed me. I, at least you should give me that. You've taken everything else. You might as well give me an explanation. Amen. But number three, I want you to know that no matter even the fact that I've learned this of you, I know it's true already. Number two, I think all, at least you can give me is an explanation of how you robbed me. But number three, even if you give me a good explanation, it seems plausible you're not a steward anymore. So go ahead and get your books together and I want you to meet me on a certain date and I want you to explain to me why before I actually let you go. So in other words, you have some time to get your books together, my books really, and I'm going to let you go no matter what. So get your house in what? Order. In order. Because I, I, I'm through with you. But you have some time to get yourself together. Okay? I'll see you on so and so a day. Boom. Number three. Then the steward said within himself, as he probably slumped down, he said, oh, I'm glad he didn't kill me right there. He said, what shall I do? For my Lord is going to maybe? No, my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig. In other words, I've been in the house for so long, I don't have the power to do the stuff that I used to do when I was out in the field anymore. I've become a steward. I've been able to drink and eat all the master's goods. I've been sitting at his table. I've been wearing his clothes. I've been using his money. Man, I've become weak. I can't dig anymore. I've lost all the cows off my hands. My hands are soft now. My muscles are flabby. I can't dig. I can't do it. I'll die if I go and dig in the sun. To beg because I've been in such a high position before? What? I'm ashamed to do that. I've got too much pride for that. I've been in the house. I've been, I've been a steward over all this money. I've gotten the, 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 the association of pride with wealth. I've gotten the, the lack of physical exercise that wealth also brings. It says also, I am... Sorry, I cannot dig. To beg, I'm ashamed. Verse 4, I'm resolved what to do. That when I'm put out of the stewardship, because I know it's coming, they may receive me into their houses. In other words, he's bringing someone else into He sees someone else that he can now bring into this scenario. They can bring me into their houses, and I'm kicked out of this one. Now remember, this was a real story that literally happened in Jerusalem, and it was well known, and people were talking about it. And Jesus now used it to show spiritual truth. Verse 5. So he called, what's those what's two next word there? Everyone. Every one of his Lord's debtors. Because remember, he had the books. And he knew not only who owed the Lord, but what they owed the Lord. Because those same books are the books that he used to profit himself and to waste all the goods of the Lord upon himself. So he found all the others who were debtors unto the Lord. And he had all these books. And he called how many? Every, did he leave anybody out? He called every one of them. And he said to the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? In other words, I already know, but I'm asking you, how much you owe? And possibly, 
and as I think about this, the reason why he asked, when he had the books right there, is he wanted to see, what, what, what he wanted to see by asking that question? Anyone know? If you're going to be honest, because if you're not honest, guess what? I can use you. Because you're a liar just like me. And I know that if I give you an offer to enter into some deception with me because you're already a liar, maybe we can work out a deal. Because say, you know, I'm about to lose a stewardship. And you owe the master so-and-so amount. And because you lied, number one, I have the books right here, bro. I have the books right here. Because you lied, I know that, hey, you might be in a bad position. You might want to get a little bit of money. Left. So, hey, you said 30 when you really owed me 50. So write down 30. Write it down. Don't worry. Write it down. I have the books. Write it down right there. Oh, man, thanks. I really appreciate that. Oh, don't worry about it. I appreciate that because guess what? When I kicked out of here, I'm coming to see you because I have blackmail power over you now. And also you owe me a favor. And all these debt, he went through all these ones and asked them, hey, how much you owe? And oh, some people said, well, I owe 50. Oh, you do? Okay. Well, you owe that much. Well, I'm giving you the ability. Go ahead and write down this. Write down half. Half? Yeah, write it down. Go ahead. Go write down. Let's read it. He said, how much do you owe? Verse 6. He said, a hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, take thy bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Now, now notice what's going on here because what we're looking at here is Christ giving us understanding of really how to rob. Can Christ give an example of how to rob? Christ give you an example of how to rob here. He said, you know, would you want to get someone into a, 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 a bind? In blackmail, you're going to go and you're going to try and test them first. Hey, you know, how much you owe? Oh, okay, okay. Well, write down this. As a matter of fact, you take your bill and you write it down. It's not going to be in my handwriting. So if something happens, oh, oh, wait a minute. How is it in his handwriting? He must have done this. You, are you following me? It's called common criminality. In other words, I'm going to get you to perjure and to criminalize yourself and even write yourself so that if something goes wrong, I got you. My, my fingerprint my, my fingerprint is on there because I'm the steward. But I don't know how you wrote that. Because basically, I'm the one supposed to be writing the book. That, that's, that's not my handwriting. That's a forgery. You follow what I'm saying? He had power over them now. If something happened, he could say, you know what? Oh, you want me to leave your house? You want me to go tell the steward that your handwriting is in the book? Crossing out 50 and writing 30? You, you want me to tell him that? Oh, I thought so. And bring me something to drink too while you're at it. You ain't kicking me out of here. I got time. Blackmail power. You see what I'm saying? It says here, verse 7, he said to another, how much owest thou? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. Now oil and wheat have a spiritual significance. We're going to come back to that. And he said unto him, take thy bill and write four score, which means 80. And the Lord commended. Verse 8, in other words, the Lord found out about that too. He had told him, hey, get your, get your house in order. I already heard what you did, but I want you to let me know how you robbed me. And then when it came back again, verse 8, now when he comes to talk to him, the Lord had already found about the second robbery too. And the Lord said what? He said, bravo. Bravo. Bra oh, bra bra yeah, you, got some, you got it, brother. brother. You, you are good. You are good. Boy, I tell you, boy, you good. You good. Man, you are good. You, you know, you are, you are, man, you have, you have real gifts. Not for me, of course, because you got to go. But you have some real gifts. He said, you know, um, how, well, let me read it. It says, and the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of life. So in other words, this master or lord of the house that had been robbed, how many times now? Twice. He commended him because even though what he did was wrong. Was it wrong? Amen. It was deceitful. Was it sin? Yes. But as far as the fact that he already was a thief, already was a robber, already was compromising his integrity, and he still had the books, it was what? Wisdom. Because he was going to be put out of the stewardship empty way. Verse 9. Well, let's read verse 8 all together. The Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. And for the children of this world, Jesus says, and through this parable, are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Because, in other words, this publican, and the publican was sitting right there, was wise in his deceits. 
and wiser in his use of what he has control over than the children of and light, according to 1 Peter, means prophecy and also means the word and truth. They are wiser with how they deal with dishonest things, wiser than those that have the truth in verity. Those, they're wiser than people that have present truth. Verse 9, and I say unto you, make to yourselves. In other words, here, I'm giving you an understanding of what we're looking at in this parable. Make to yourselves. Now, this is an amazing text here. Make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. Can you imagine? In other words, here's an example for all Christians, for you disciples, hey, Peter, John, I want you to make to yourselves friends of the unrighteous mammon. Can you imagine? Jesus using this as an example to say, hey, I want you to make this example your example in ministry. You say, Lord, have mercy. But again, we're talking about spiritual things now. Again, make to yourselves Friends of the man of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into what kind of habitations? Everlasting. Everlasting. This steward in the parable dealt with earthly tabernacles, earthly houses, and earthly goods that were, were being uh, uh, deceitfully used. But we're talking about what kind of eternal, uh, what kind of uh, habitations? Eternal or everlasting habitation. So there's a greater spiritual meaning behind this literal, so-called, even devious wisdom here. Verse 10, he that is faithful in that which is what? Even earthly goods. We be faithful in that which is also what? Which is spiritual things, right? And he that is unjust in the what? Earthly things. will be unjust also in the what? Spiritual things. So again, so now we're not just talking about the message to the disciples. And hey, you need to follow this wisdom. Also, it says, if the unjust do it, or the publicans are wise in Carnal things that God can, if they're converted, be used them to get, get, have hold of spiritual things. And also, if those that supposedly have spiritual things, or the great things, are unjust in the spiritual things, we're talking about the, the, the Pharisees and the leaders now, then also you will be unfaithful in... Brothers and sisters, the parable has three applications, because how many people are in the congregation? Three. 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 Jesus goes on and says... Verse 11, if therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you the true riches? And if you have been unfaithful or faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and what? God and mammon. And out of all that were there, you had the disciples, you had the, the scribes and Pharisees, you had the, the public and sinners. Who were the people that, that answered out and were upset about this parable? Look at the next verse. And the Pharisees also who were covetous heard all these things and what? So who was hit the most by this parable? Pharisees. Mm. We're talking about three examples here of how this parable teaches divine truth. Now of this Scenario. We've read it. We've read it. And we have a, an understanding of some things. We've learned some things already. From what we've seen so far, can we look at these three groups and say that the disciples and also the scribes and Pharisees were considered a part of the kingdom of God? Can we say that? Can we say that? You're not sure? The Pharisees and, and the Sadducees and the leaders were over the visible church and they were seen outwardly as being a part of the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. The disciples were with Christ and Christ was preaching about the kingdom of God, so they also were seen as being a part of the kingdom of God. Can you agree with that? Amen. You put them over there. And on the other side, you see these, scribes, these, uh, sorry, these publicans and sinners who were seen as being outside the church, cast off and forsaken, but also the ones among whom Jesus was mainly dealing with. The scribe and Pharisee said, this man is among sinners and he eats with them. He was constantly working for their good. So you see these three groups, we're going to divide them for our sake of our time into two groups, but we're going to deal with all three. Did you get that? Amen. The scribes and Pharisees and the disciples on one side, and you're going to deal with the sinners on the other side. Can you see that? Amen. Okay. When we look at this understanding, let's first deal with this idea of the scribe, not scribe, scribe, the Pharisees, the, the, the publicans and sinners, or those that were seen outside the church. To the carnal mind, to the natural mind, Jesus was talking and telling them, hey, if you could be wise in those things that are earthly, and you can use uh, devious wisdom to use the stewardship you have to the benefit of yourself and others, 
that if you were converted, if you were regenerated, if you could be using God's kingdom with a spiritual mind, you could be entrusted with spiritual riches. Because you're using wisdom. Wisdom is wisdom, even if it's good or bad. When we talk about the idea of these people that were looked as outside the church, there were many different truths that God wanted to teach them, as well as the disciples. Because when it comes to money, Jesus said you cannot trust or have faith in or love God and mammon. You must love the one and hate the other. Even though you may use mammon, but you must love God supremely and use, even with disdain, mammon. Let's look at some text quickly, shall we? Look at the book of Luke quickly. Look again, Luke chapter 12. Luke the 12th chapter. What was he trying to teach them? What he found teaching all throughout the scriptures. In Luke 12 it says this. Luke 12 and verse 33. Luke the 12th chapter and verse 33. When you have it, please say amen. amen. Luke 12, Luke the 12th chapter, and we're looking for verse 33. Luke 12, 33 says this. It says, sell that ye have. This is what he taught all throughout the scriptures. Sell that ye have and give what? Amen. Alms or good or donations or charity. Sell that you have and give alms. Provide for yourselves bags which what? Wax, Wax not old. A treasure in the heavens that faileth not where no thief approaches, neither moth corrupteth. In other words, by the fact that they were giving and selling they had and providing for those that had not, they were doing better than putting in the bank. They were putting their treasure where? In heaven, where raw moth does not go and corrupt, where rust does not corrupt, they were laying up eternal riches. Verse 34 says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. also. Here we see a principle by the word of God that these individuals in Luke 12 were giving, and by giving it to those in need, they were doing God's service and laying up treasure as if they were putting it in a bank. But laying up treasure, not upon the earth, but in and by that, by this good work, doing the work of God, they land up in an eternal store. This steward in the book of Luke 16, we're in Luke 12 here, but we're talking about Luke 16. In Luke 16, this steward wasted his master's good. It didn't say he took it and put it in a secret bank account. It didn't say he took it and hid it in the earth. He took it and did what? In other words, he wasted it in harlots. Food and drink and clothing that, 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 that tore. I mean, he would buy his shirt and would rip up. You know, when you take things that don't belong to you, it seems like they're always gone quickly. You buy something, you know, you stole the money. It, just, it, it always breaks. It, it never can last. It's like you have a bag with holes in it. So he took the money and he did what? He used it for his present need. He used it and expended it upon his lust, like the prodigal son, and it was gone. So when it came time when he was called for answer for his stewardship, he had what? Nothing. So in other words, when he was out of the stewardship, he had nothing. He had put nothing away for the future. Nothing away for the future. So in that intermittent time, that intermission there, he had to make a plan by which he would make provision for his future. And the only way, from a wisdom here, he was commended by God. The only way he could truly exercise wisdom, the fact that he had a short amount of time and nothing for the future, he had to now bring others into his deception and now change his plan of deception. Before his deception was basically taking his money and using it in present need for himself. But in order to exercise wisdom and to live beyond losing the stewardship, he had to, he had to change his way of working. In other words, if he wanted to live and continue, he had to change his way of working and now work by bringing others into this stewardship and by giving unto them, he would make a way by which he would have future or an insurance plan for the future. Can you see what I'm saying in the carnal sense? Oh, you don't see it. What he was doing is in the natural sense, he was bringing people in to his own stewardship, even through deception now, and through deception, he brought them in and made them partners with him. So by doing so, by giving away, not keeping for himself, by giving unto others, he would have places to dwell forever or all of his life. The spiritual story is, and we look at Luke chapter 12, as you give, you what? Receive, Receive where? Return eternal blessings. In other words, the giving in this earthly sphere of this literal money was even a method by which you were putting treasure in heaven, heaven where you'd be able to take a, a, not only a count out here, but also you would have eternal habitation to dwell in. Okay, we're looking at Luke 6 now. Look at Luke 6. Luke 6, 38. 
Luke 6, 38. This principle we see all through the Word of God. Luke 6, 38. And it was teaching not only the disciples the truth, but also it was teaching the publicans and sinners the reality of how God, through giving, they could be blessed. Remember Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus learned this and he was able to be saved by the power of Christ and he was ready to give immediately. It's funny how people say they love God and they don't want to give. Luke 6 says this. Luke 6. Luke 6 says it. Luke 6 and verse 38. Luke 6, 38 says this. It says, give and it shall... Are we there? Amen. Luke 6, 38. It says, give and it shall be what? Given. given unto you. In other words, you reap what you? Sow. What you sow. Give and it shall be given unto you. At first he didn't see this. The steward did. The steward didn't see this. But because of the reality of recognizing that he had to give an account for his life, he saw that if he wanted to live forever, per se, he had to change the way he worked and now give that he might what? Receive. That he might be able to give to others in other houses and he may enter into those houses forever. Luke 6, 38 says, Giving it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over. Shall men give into your bosom? For with the same measure that ye meet, with all shall it be measured to you. You reap what? What you sow. What you sow. You reap what you sow. So when these principles were being put out, these gifts and so on, these alms, or giving to those that are in need, by this you were receiving what you gave. But as you gave, you would receive. As you give to others, you would receive. And the spiritual blessings we were looking for, not just temporal, it said here that men were given to your bosom, that's true. God will impress upon men to give unto you and to help you and to do a work to even do ministry. Many times we think that by holding on to money that we can, but sometimes we have to understand that there is a real purpose in saving for a future day, but there's a real purpose in giving as God would have us because this is a principle of eternity. This understood started to work upon a principle that was divine. And it was teaching the disciples as well as the, the, the sinners and publicans a spiritual lesson of how to enter into eternal tabernacles. Look at uh, 1 Timothy quickly. 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy 6. And let's drop our eyes down to verse 17. 17 to 19. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 to 19. Say amen when you have that. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 through 19. Let's look at this as the scripture as we leave, leave this idea for a moment. In 1 Timothy 6 and verse 17 it says, Charge them that are what? Rich. Charge them that are rich in this what? Word. In this world. That they be not high-minded or trusting in certain riches. Like that unjust steward did, right? Mm -hmm. But in the what? Living God. Living God who, is, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. That they do what? What should they do, these rich people? Do good. That they be rich in what? Rich in money, good rich in good works. And he's always told us in Luke those good works, right? Amen. Ready to do what? Distribute. To give out. Ready to do what also? Communicate. Communicate. That means to uh, make sure that others receive. Laying up in store for themselves. By this, a good what? Foundation. Against the time to come that they may ha lay hold upon. Life. Do you see it? All throughout the scripture to give this principle that was trying to be taught in the 16th chapter of Luke. And the disciples need to understand the spiritual principle if they were going to do this work of faith with the gospel. Because they had to give it away. They had to give it away. In other words, the disciples were men that had great sins. Wasn't Peter a sinner? He said, he said Lord, I'm a sinner. Jumped inside the ocean. He was a sinner. How about John? Wasn't he vengeful? Amen. You can say anything about John. He always was easily offended. Sons of thunder, right? These men had natural traits of character that would have caused them to lose an eternal life. But because Jesus would make them fishers of men, if they were willing, they could be transformed. And so you and I can be transformed by that same power. However, our previous mode of operation has gathered for us corruption. In other words, we have been given the breath of life. Isn't everyone here alive? Aren't you breathing right now? Amen. Everyone's breathing. Everyone's here. Everyone drove here, walked here. However you got here, you came here, you sat down, you opened your Bible, you're interacting with the, the word you're hearing, your mind is thinking, so on. You are experiencing life. Amen? And that life is a gift. You've been also given money, opportunities, all kinds of things. And when we look at our life before we found Christ, what did we do with those opportunities in our life? We wasted it. Whose life was it? The rich man's. Are you following me? 
All those things that we had were his and it was stewardship for us to do a work of giving and use in his will. But we have wasted many of those things on our selves, on ourselves. So the scribes and Pharisees, the publicans and sinners, disciples all sitting there. So the, the, the publicans and sinners are seeing this and they're looking and say, you know what? All these blessings I've received from God, I have wasted, yes, I have money, but I've wasted these blessings upon God. And the only way that I could turn around my situation is I must give unto the poor. Well, that may be good in itself, but there was a greater work that God wants you to give. God has given you life, and the only way you can turn this around is by giving all. Didn't Jesus say you must die daily? Didn't Jesus say that unless you die in this world or, or die in this life, you can't live eternally? You must give all. And unless you give all, you can't receive. You must be born again. This, these, these sinners saw that there was a greater work than even the physical money. There was a greater work. There was a greater work for them to do. And this greater work was to give of all they had. Not just the money, brothers and sisters, even all the gifts that God had given them because they had been unjust. They had wasted everything. And the only way that they could now enter into eternity is to give everything to others. Has God given you life? Now you must live for others. Jesus lived a life of service. He lived an example of what this means to now give all that the good man, the rich man, had given him to others. To sit down with people and say, hey, how much do you owe the rich man? Oh, I owe this much. Oh, do you? Let's see if we can remove your sins. You're not following me. Let's see if we can start sanctifying you and bringing this debt of sin down in your life. Let's see if we can now enter in to go into everyone we know and lessening the sins in their life. Not by our power, but by allowing them to take the book. Oh, you didn't miss the process. Take this book and look at what this book, look at what the book says about your debts. And I want you, by your own hand, to start moving through this book and getting these sins, moving these sins, and lessening these sins. You got to take the book in your own hand and do your part in making sure these sins are lessened. Brother and sister, what a wonderful example of true wisdom. Oh, brother and sister, but there wasn't only one person there. There were three groups there. Three groups there. And the other group is the disciples. Not just the, the publicans and sinners, but the disciples sat there. And the disciples are important because this parable was for the disciples. Why? Because Jesus was going to, like a rich man, give unto them a great stewardship. And these individuals, remember, them and the scribes and Pharisees were accounted among Israel. In the book of Acts 7, it says that the children of Israel, both the leaders of the church as well as the disciples, as the stock of Israel, stock of Abraham, these individuals had received the law by the disposition of angels. They had great light. They had the truth. They had the law and the prophets. They had the miracles. They had all the testimony. The law and the testimony. Did they not? Amen. They had the blessings of God in the scriptures. All the blessings of God were yea and amen to them in Christ. But brothers and sisters, when we talk about the disciples, God was going to give them this new covenant commission to go into all the world and do a great work. And previous to knowing Christ, and even previous to the cross, what had they done with the three and a half years of instruction? Wasted it. Didn't Peter warm his hands and curse? Curse bad words. Not darn. He was cursing four letter words. I don't know that blanky blank. Did he not? Judas sold him out and tried to come in unlike the unjust steward, give an account for his stewardship and lie, lie even there. Brothers and sisters, all these disciples fled. It as if Christ had wasted all the gospel. It was as if the, all the gospel was wasted. But Peter went and went to the Garden of Gethsemane and knelt right where Christ had agonized, right in the blood from his sweat, bro, sweat, uh, sweat and blood uh, soaked brow, that same blood he knelt in and he deeply confessed. John jumped out of his clothes but put some new ones on and came back to the cross. Brothers and sisters, something happened around the cross that showed that even though it seemed like that work had been wasted upon them, they saw when the Holy Spirit brought these things back to their remembrance that there was a greater work to be done. And even though they had wasted everything as they came, remember Jesus said to you, uh, uh, Peter, do you love me? You know I love you, Lord. 
Peter, do you love me? He's not getting mad. You, you know I love you, Lord. Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. He was brought back in because he had to now take the same substance he had wasted. And that was the gospel, right? And he had wasted it upon himself. Then they want to be, everyone wanted to be next to, can I sit in the throne next to you? I want my sons to be next to you on this side and that side of you in the kingdom. I want to wear rich robes. I want to rule over this. I, what should I get in your kingdom, brother, uh, Lord? They wanted to expend all these things upon themselves. But when the gospel came to their mind and they saw the true weight of receiving the gospel, the gospel wasn't to give themselves thrones and robes and dominion. It was to give them the ability through the spirit and through the truth in practical lines and spiritual lines to give unto others. When they saw themselves as sinners because of their condition prior to the cross, they saw they had to now operate on a different plan of operation. You know, I found this. A different plan of operation. And they could not now be selfish and desire the kingdom for themselves. They saw that the kingdom work was for others. And they now saw that this, this idea that they saw in the book, this ledger, not only showed their debts, but the debts of all the world. And they saw that they must now, if they're truly going to enter into those eternal tabernacles and sit upon thrones, they must give unto others. You follow me? It was about giving. And by giving, they would give all. Give all. Give all. They would find everyone and the same riches, eternal riches, in the gospel. They would give. They would sit down with people with the book and help them receive eternal riches. Because by doing this, they were doing the work of Christ and they were laying up treasure in heaven. heaven. Jesus said these worldlings are wise in the children of light in their generation. If only the disciples could understand this truth and work according to this mode of gospel work. But brothers and sisters, it wasn't just two groups there, was it? No. It was three groups. It wasn't just the scribes, sorry, the publicans and sinners and the disciples. It was also the scribes, Pharisees, or what you call the elders. This third group. That, that group that was, uh, that was out of all the three upset and started to deride Christ because they were most affected by the parable because they were covetous. Covetous. Now why did this scripture hit them? Because the same situation that the publicans and sinners were in open transgression, they were in secret sin. Because how many times did Jesus claim the temple from robbery and theft? How many times the same thing seen in this parable in the 16th chapter of Luke take place in the very temple courts with, with offerings and sacrifices. How much robbery and theft and graft and embezzlement was going on with God's holy money. And were they not guilty before God as a great man, a rich man, and as stewards, weren't they guilty before God? The Bible says to Malachi this. Look at Malachi. Malachi. Malachi the third chapter. You know what the text says. We're going to read it and look at it for the sake of the scripture honing in and really burning upon your mind these truths. In the book of Malachi, the last book of the New Testament, or Old Testament I should say, Malachi chapter 3 knows what the Bible says concerning the priests of God as well as the whole nation. In Luke 3, sorry, Malachi 3 says this. Malachi 3 and verse 8. Malachi 3.8 says, will a man rob God? Speaking to the whole eight nation now, will a man rob God, yet ye have what? Robbed Rob me. But ye say, wherein have we? Robbed In other words, what the unjust Jew, uh, steward didn't do, they did. The unjust steward didn't say, well, how, how did I rob you? He didn't say that. He knew, the rich man knew and he knew that he was guilty. He had nothing to say. He had only to put his plan in action. God doesn't need your excuses. God needs you to see the condition that you're in and there's no way out except to give. Give all. This is, the all, this is your only hope, to give your whole heart. Give all your sins. Give all your life. It's by giving that we live. It's a new principle. So here in Malachi, these priests, the children of Israel, though they supposedly had the truth, they want to argue with God. You know, wherein have we robbed thee? As if you can't see everything. Where have we robbed thee? He says in tithes and offerings. Well, well, as priests, aren't we supposed to receive the tithe? No, you have robbed me. Even this whole nation have you. Uh, how are you priests putting these tithes in the stock market? Isn't that robbing me? How are you priests using these tithes for various things that shouldn't be used? How are you using these things in the way you're using it and engrossing yourselves? 
Selfishness. Brother and sister, it says, ye have robbed me in tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me even this whole nation, priests and people. Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now here with the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Brothers and sisters, the Bible says that these individuals had robbed God in tithe and offerings. offerings. Tithe and offerings. And because they robbed them tithe and offerings, God said they were cursed with a curse, and they could not receive the spiritual blessing that come from where? Heaven. Above. He couldn't open the windows of heaven because of this condition that was in Israel. Now, brothers and sisters, weren't they robbing him in many other ways? Didn't they also have the truth? How many lepers and palsy and sick were everywhere in Israel when the, the priests had a knowledge, according to the Bible, of health and healing? Were they doing that work? They were robbing God. How many people were unconverted and in sin and bonded to sin when they...